There is a uh, video evidence of me claiming that the Bardadin is the best build in the game. So to avoid becoming the boy who cried best build, I'll call the Gloomstalker Assassin the second best build in the game. But I wouldn't be mad at you if you thought it was better than the Bardadin. Let me try and summarize what I think of this build. If my life depended on finishing honor mode solo, no companions, I would pick this build over just about any other build in the game. I think it's that overpowered. In fact, I think the only weakness of this build is that it's too good. It really comes to a point where whenever I run this build in my party comp, I begin to neglect my other companions and my other builds because they rarely ever take a turn in combat. Usually fights are over the same turn it begins. I think this build is a must have in your playthrough, especially if you haven't tried a Gloomstalker Assassin yet. Sharpshooter is completely broken because the penalty can almost entirely be offset as soon as you take the feat. So it's just a flat plus 10 to your damage. And magic arrows are so busted, you can practically adapt to the demands, the differing demands of each fight in real time. Say, so say you're fighting an undead, there are arrows of undead slain to deal double damage to him. If you're fighting constructs, there are arrows of construct slaying. If your enemy is vulnerable to lightning, there are arrows of lightning. Not to mention, of course, the most unbalanced item in the game, the, the arrow of many targets, which allows you to shoot up to four enemies per shot, which is eight when at level five when you get your extra attack, which is 12 with haste, which is 16 with the elixir of bloodlust. I mean, 16 instances of damage to 16 different enemies. And suddenly, just like that, just because of one magic arrow, this build is also one of the best AoE damage dealers in the game. So with that said, and after that pitch, let's get into the build. So in terms of selecting a race, there's two things I need to get out of the way before I give the play whatever you want disclaimer. The first one, lest this become a trope of this channel, is of course a Starion Ex Machina. For any martial class, it's always going to be a Starion. It's especially relevant for this build because his happy buff, which gives us a plus one to our attack rolls, helps offset the sharpshooter debuff. And then of course his ascension bonus actually does apply to our bow and arrow. It counts as a weapon, so it gives an extra 1d10 necrotic to all of our arrow attacks, which is also insane. So as always, a Starion is the right pick. But if there's ever been a build that solicits playing the Dark Urge, it's this one. The Dark Urge, aka the Deathstalker Mantle, okay? That cape that you get in Act 1, the Deathstalker Mantle, from playing the Urge, is just that good. It's build definingly strong. Once per turn, when you kill an enemy, you become invisible, which will essentially mean that you're invulnerable until you attack, and that your next attack coming out of invisibility has advantage. The Deathstalker Mantle is especially strong on this build, because we're gonna be taking a feat that penalizes our attack rolls, a minus five from sharpshooter to attack rolls. So having a consistent source of advantage is actually gonna allow us to take sharpshooter at level four, whereas otherwise we'd be inclined to take it at level eight so that the debuff is not as significant. So ultimately, the absolute highest performing combination of races, so to speak, would be to play the Dark Urge, recruit a Starion in your party, and then both build the Gloomstalker Assassin on a Starion and give him the Deathstalker mantle cape that the Dark Urge would otherwise get. Which I would recommend anyway, because this build doesn't have any use for charisma and would make a relatively poor face character. With all of that out the way, the races that are otherwise best suited for this build include the usual suspects of the Wood Elf and the Wood Half Elf for their mobility, their dark vision, and saving throw proficiencies. With a massive shout out to the Lightfoot Halfling and the Dwergar. The Lightfoot Halfling for two main reasons. First being the lucky passive, mitigating our critical misses, which is generally good, but especially good because accuracy can be a huge problem for this build in the early game because of sharpshooter. And their lightfoot passive, naturally stealthy, granting us advantage on our stealth checks, which will inevitably increase the amount of free hits we can get off before entering turn-based mode and initiating combat. The Dwergar, on the other hand, can cast invisibility as a cantrip, Invisibility, I've found, is the most reliable way to make enemies surprised, which is otherwise difficult, it's a pretty gimmicky and flawed mechanic in this game, and you'll need to eventually guarantee surprises to make the best use of our Assassin multiclass, which will guarantee critical hits on surprise enemies. Invisibility is also good uh, to add on to our sources of reliable advantage to again offset the penalty from Sharpshooter, so Dwergar is another really, really strong choice. Moving on to our leveling curve and stat distribution, 
unlike many other multi-class builds in the game, I don't think you have many options in terms of your leveling progression. So the three classes we're going to be introducing into this multi-class is going to be five ranger, four rogue, and three fighter. But as I've stressed in my other build guide, you want to get your martial extra attack as soon as physically possible, such that starting out as anything other than a ranger would be delaying our martial extra attack by that many levels too many. And that's not to mention the fact that you get the archery fighting style at ranger level 2, and an incredible free attack at ranger level 3 and therefore gloomstalker level 1, which just puts it beyond doubt that the ranger is the correct class to start leveling and to take until level 5. So quickly skimming over your favorite enemy types, in my opinion there's only really two options that are viable in Bounty Hunter and Ranger Knight. Bounty Hunter is okay, the debuff applied from the Ensnaring Strike is significant in the early game, which is the only portion of the game where Ensnaring Strike is significant, so it's okay, it's situationally good. Keeper of the Veil and Sanctified Stalker give you two spells that you're never going to fully realize. Your Wisdom's never going to be high enough for Sacred Flame to pose any actual threat, and there's so many better spells for a Ranger to concentrate on than protection from evil and good, so these are also just okay. Mage Breaker, I mean, it's just phenomenal, right? It gives you access to the It's the single worst spell in the entire game. So we're just gonna quickly skip over Mage Breaker into what is the actual best pick, which is Ranger Knight giving you heavy armor proficiency, which is akin to just taking Fighter at level one as well for heavy armor proficiency. In my opinion, this is clear and cut the best pick for favorite enemy, maybe, maybe, maybe second to Bounty Hunter. On to our natural explorer. Urban Tracker is interesting and it's good for adventuring, right? It gives you a bonus to your sleight of hand, but since there are infinite amount of ways to raise your ability checks outside of combat with things like Guidance, Enhanced Ability, or Bardic Inspirations, as well as quite literally an infinite amount of Thieves tools to be found and looted around the world, I would just suggest going for one of the Wasteland Wanderers, which gives you resistance to the respective elemental damage type. The most common one which you might be afflicted by is fire, so in my opinion the play is to go for fire, wasteland or wonder fire. For our background, if you went with the recommended choice of the Dark Urge, you won't get a choice here, you just get the Haunted one by default. If you aren't the Dark Urge, feel free to choose Urchin, which I think is the best and has the best synergy with what we're already proficient in and what we're going to utilize throughout the campaign. For our ability points, we're going to go with our plus 2 bonus into our dexterity and our plus 1 bonus into our constitution. To our dexterity, we're going to go to 16. 17, if you plan on giving this character the Hag's Hair, in which case you should give it to their dexterity so that they can have a baseline of 18 dexterity. 16 constitution. 14 wisdom, as most of our spells scale with wisdom and for wisdom saving throws. If you insist on this character being your face character, you can put the rest of your points into Charisma, which is otherwise a dump stat. If you are not using this character as a face character, and maybe a companion has it like a Starion, you can put the rest into Intelligence. I am purposefully foregoing the Strength attribute, as I will discuss later in the video, we're going to have a piece of gear that will set our Strength to 19 throughout the entireties of Act 1 and 2. At Ranger level 2, we get access to a few spells and our fighting style. For our spells, it is critical that someone in your party can cast Long Strider and very useful if someone in your party can cast Enhanced Leap. So if no other party member fulfills these roles, I would just take both of these. If there is one or both that another can, take the one that another can't and Hunter's Mark to weaponize your bonus action. For our fighting style, we're obviously going to go for Archery, giving us a plus 2 to our weapon attacks. Not to be confused with our damage rolls, this is not a plus two to our damage, it's a plus two to our rolls that determine whether or not we actually hit the enemy. At ranger level three, we get access to another spell and our subclass. For our spell, all spell picks are relatively inconsequential for this build, so you can just go for ensnaring strike or fog cloud for pickpocketing. For our subclass, we're going to be choosing what is arguably one of the strongest subclasses in Baldur's Gate 3 in the Gloomstalker. For one, we get Dread Ambusher, which gives us a plus three bonus to our initiative. Coupled with our already really high dexterity, it's going to be very rare that we don't go first in combat. It also increases our movement speed and gives us a completely free of charge attack in the first turn of combat that deals an additional 1d8 damage. We also get Hide as a bonus action, which if successful, will make the next attack coming out of Hide with advantage, 
which is really good considering our sharpshooters penalty. We also get Umbral Shroud, which will be yet another consistent way to get invisibility, which will then mean a consistent way to get surprise off on our enemies, which will mean a bunch of guaranteed critical strikes when we get our Assassin subclass. At Ranger level 4, we get access to our first feat. And, although it's a contentious decision, I believe in taking Sharpshooter as soon as level 4. Sharpshooter grants us a flat plus 10 to our ranged weapon damage at the cost of a minus 5 penalty to our ranged weapon attack rolls. A lot of people advise against taking Sharpshooter this early because the minus 5 penalty is quite intimidating at this level but I think you should absolutely take Sharpshooter as early as level 4, because the increase to our damage output is equally as alluring and beneficial as the penalty is intimidating. And there are so many ways to offset the penalty. Just to name a few, there are Weapon Oils for plus 2 to your attack rolls, Astarian's Happy Buff for a plus 1 to your attack rolls, the Archery Fighting Style, which already reduces the penalty from Sharpshooter to a minus 3 instead of a minus 5, Literally any source of advantage, whether it be the Dark Urge Cape, attacking out of hide, attacking out of invisibility, high ground, enemies being threatened, there are weapon enchantments, there are gear pieces. Even if you are steadfast on the opinion that the penalty is too severe, you can always take Sharpshooter, put the ability on your hotbar, and dynamically turn it off and on for when the penalty is too damaging to your hit chance. And in that respect, you can treat Sharpshooter as an occasional on-demand damage mechanic if and when you can afford to risk it. For our final Ranger level, Ranger level 5, we get access finally to our Martial Extra Attack, meaning that in our first turn of combat, we can now fire 3 shots, 2 with our Action and 1 with our Dread Amateur Hide. We get Misty Step as a spell, which is a better use, one of the better uses of our spell slots. Speaking of which, we also get an additional final spell. Although there are some gimmicky applications of Pass Without Trace, if you don't know about them, there are a few builds out there where you use Pass Without Trace and you essentially never go into combat because you perpetually pass the stealth checks. So you just fire arrows, pass the stealth check, never initiate combat, and you can kill groups of enemies and some bosses with it. But it's a bit gimmicky and not the purpose of this video or this build. So we're going to be going for what is arguably one of the better level 2 spell slots in the entire game in spike growth. If you create a chokehold where the enemies have to pass through the spike growth to get to you, the AI is terrible at dealing with it and it's easily one of the best control spells in the game. At total level 6 we finally introduce Rogue into our multi-class. At Rogue level 1 we get access to our sneak attack and further proficiencies in sleight of hand and stealth. Rogue level 2 is pretty boring. <laughs> we get access to Cunning Action Hide twice. Amazing. But we do get access to Dash as a bonus action, Disengage as a bonus action, which isn't bad to be fair. We finally access our second subclass in the Assassin, and really the last level this build needs to come online. Let's go through the features. Assassinate Initiative will grant us advantage against enemies that have not taken a turn yet. Remember that the Gloomstalker subclass gave us a plus 3 bonus to our initiative. Coupled with our really high dexterity, we're practically always going first in combat, which in practice will mean that we have an advantage on all of our attack rolls in the first turn of combat as no one else has taken a turn before us. Assassinate Ambush will convert any successful attack roll against a surprise enemy into a critical hit which emphasizes the importance of starting combat from stealth or invisibility to surprise your enemies and do hundreds of damage in the first turn. Again, surprise is pretty inconsistent in this game, but I've found the best way to guarantee quote-unquote surprise is to initiate combat from invisibility specifically. Assassin's Alacrity will refund any actions used outside of combat upon entering combat which will allow this build to initiate combat from invisibility for free, essentially. This is a good time to talk about the fundamental principle of this build, which is damage output in the first turn of combat. Especially when it comes to gearing later on in the video, 
The focus is having as many actions and dealing as much damage as possible in the very first turn of combat. Because in the first turn of combat, we have a free shot to initiate combat, the extra Dread Ambusher attack, advantage on all of our attack rolls, and guaranteed critical hits on all enemies, assuming that they're surprised. The first turn is the most important turn of combat, and therefore our goal is to end combat within that first turn. At total level 9, we take our fourth and final level into Rogue, because there's not another direction we could take that gives us as much value as the immediate value of another feat does. Of which, the best option really is just a plus 2 ability score improvement, setting your dexterity to 18 without the Hag's Hair or 20 with the Hag's Hair. No other feat really benefits us as much as the bonus to our armor class and accuracy will from the ability improvement. Alert would be the other feat I would recommend usually for most other builds, but it's kind of redundant on this build because you have so many bonuses to your initiative already. Really the only choice to think about here is just taking an ability improvement. At level 10, we've fully exhausted all the benefits we need from Rogue in the shape of a subclass and a feat. So we begin to dip into our third multi-class in Fighter. Why Fighter? Almost entirely for Action Surge. Why Action Surge? Well, if you remember our build philosophy of maximizing our action and damage output in the first turn of combat, Action Surge is a cost-effective way of gaining another action, which in that first turn of combat could mean that many more shots, that many more critical hits, and that much more damage. For our fighting style, the only remaining fighting style that is of any benefit to us is defense as we will be wearing armor, so it's a nice plus one bonus to our armor class. At level 11, we finally get our action surge. At level 12, there are a few choices that you can make. One is to introduce a one level dip of any of the remaining classes that you believe will benefit our existing synergies. The other is to take a third level into fighter for either the battle master or champion subclass. There are merits to taking either and the battle master maneuvers are legitimately viable but for this build, I'll be taking a third level into Fighter and Champion as my subclass for the reduction to our crit range. It may seem counterintuitive and rather redundant because we're guaranteed critical hits, but there are two caveats to that notion. One is that obviously not all fights will be over in one turn, even with how good this build is. Two is that, as aforementioned, surprise is a really inconsistent mechanic to proc. Even when you think you have the perfect setup, sometimes it just doesn't. And in honor mode where you don't get to save and load, it's really important to have contingencies in the form of just natural crit range reduction so you can naturally crit in spite of what should be our first turn. As always, I want to preface that Illithid powers are entirely supplementary and by no means necessary to the functionality of the build, but using them will always benefit your playthrough and make things easier. It's always a good idea to take Psionic Backlash and Call the Weak on as many party members as possible to both weaponize your reaction on enemy turns, as well as reduce the number of hit points enemies need to die so these are always safe and worthy investments on as many party members as possible. Favorable Beginnings is great in the early game as a boost to our hit chance and is yet another way to mitigate the sharpshooter penalty, but Ability Drain stands out as one of the better picks for this build. As we will be making attacks with ranged weapons and therefore with dexterity, we'll be draining enemies of their dexterity by one point, which unless they're wearing heavy armor, will reduce their armor class by one point, increasing our hit chance on all subsequent attack rolls. Because this can essentially be viewed as a plus one to our hit chance, and yet another mitigation to our sharpshooter penalty, it takes precedence over many of the other inner circle illithid powers. Now, unlike my Bardadin guide, going partial illithid is entirely up to you. I always choose to do it for fly, black hole, and psionic dominance and because I play on PC and I can mod away the uh, visual of it. But range builds don't suffer from the same limitations to their mobility as melee builds do. Like we don't need to really move around that much to hit our target. So fly becomes much less valuable and really alleviates the necessity of going partial with it. It's entirely up to you. It doesn't really matter all that much for this build. 
Before I get into best in slot gearing, I want to bring to light one of the most important aspects of this build that isn't part of the leveling or gearing, magic arrows. Magic arrows are not solely responsible for your damage, but are extremely versatile and diversify your damage profile to deal more than just piercing damage and to more than one target. There's three main categories of magic arrows that you'll be using. Elemental arrows, arrows of slaying, and most importantly, arrows of many targets. In Act 1, you'll mostly have access to elemental arrows. These can take advantage of vulnerabilities to elemental damage types that are either pre-existing enemies, like the Woodwodes near Auntie Ethel or the Drunk Kobolds in the Monastery, or vulnerabilities in enemies that you create. So for example, like the Wet Condition, doubling the amount of damage you deal with arrows of ice or arrows of light. Upon reaching Act 2, all varieties of magical arrows become available to you. Arrows of slaying become your go-to for single target, inflicting double damage against their corresponding monster types. In most cases, these are actually capable of one to two, maybe three shotting many of the early game bosses. They also serve as an effective counter to piercing resistance as the double damage will be halved to do regular damage as opposed to the half damage your regular arrows would do, if that makes sense. And of course, the single most unfair element of this build are the arrows of many targets. These shoot up to four enemies per arrow, but the most insane part of these arrows, besides the unbelievable action economy, is that despite the tooltip saying they deal half damage to the other three enemies, the arrows of many targets do not have the damage of your damage riders. So although it will have the piercing damage to the other three targets, it won't have the other types of damage which are applied to the initial target, such as the acid damage from the caustic band, the strength multiplier from the titan string bow, the elemental damage type from the drake throat glaive, the list goes on. The arrow of many targets elevates this build from what is otherwise elite single target damage to one of the best AoE damage dealers in the game, bar none. On the topic of magic arrows, the one question I get asked the most in my comment section is, how do you have so many magic arrows? Would you believe me if I told you the answer was Barkus Root? More specifically, I use a trick to restock a vendor's inventory multiple times per long rest and constantly buy out their supply of magic arrows. It just so happens that one of the most readily available supplies of all magic arrow types is Barkus Root at Last Light in in Act 2, who is unironically where I get most of my arrows for the entirety of my campaigns. So make sure you save him in Act 1 from the windmill. The trick is super simple. A vendor's inventory refreshes anytime anyone in your party levels up. So when I reach Last Light Inn in Act 2, I switch my party to all the companions that I haven't been using and that are most likely level 1, and level them up one by one buying out Barkus Root's inventory of magic arrows every single time I level. If all your companions are leveled, you can also just go to Withers, respec yourself, and loop this infinitely to theoretically buy an infinite number of magic arrows. So long as you have levels to level, you can buy out more and more magic arrows. If you're thinking to yourself, well that seems awfully expensive, although you'd be right, there are a plethora of ways to scale your economies to what is virtually unlimited. Whether that be using backpack exploits, pickpocketing, or just looting every single thing in the environment, there are a multitude of ways of which there are tons of videos online on how to farm gold. Moving on to our best in slot gear, in similar fashion to my Bardadin video, I'm going to be wearing what I think is the best possible combination of gear pieces offered in each act, but we'll have alternatives in my inventory that you can use as placeholders until you get the gear that I'm wearing, or that you can switch with the gear that I'm wearing if you think that they're a better choice. If you have neither of the gear pieces, just assume that you should equip whatever is the best possible gear piece for the missing slot that you actually own. For our helmet, we have the Grim Skull Helm, obtained by defeating Grimm inside the Grim Forge. It's a great defensive piece that compensates for what is otherwise a defensively lacking combination of armor pieces that we'll be wearing, which I think is fine and can be justified as I'll explain when I'm talking about our chest piece. For our cape, we have the Deathstalker mantle, 
which your butler grants you after killing Alfira as the Dark Urge. This is the best cape in Act 1, in Act 2, in Act 3. If they made in Act 4, it would be the best in that as well. It's so good for this build that it feels like it was made with Sharpshooter and Ranger in mind. A no-brainer and a must-have. For our chess piece, we have the Cat's Grace sold by Lady Esther in the Mountain Pass. Although it has an abysmally low armor class, I think the Cat's Grace effect justifies its armor class. A plus two increase can set our dexterity to 20 with the Hag's Hair in Act 1, which is unbelievable for both offsetting the Sharpshooter penalty and, ironically, increasing our armor class. I think 18 is respectable, and because we're a range attacker, you should be able to mitigate the amount of damage you're taking by just maintaining a distance away from your enemies. So overall, I think the effect is worth what's otherwise just a couple of points of armor class, even in honor mode. For gloves, we have the Gloves of Archery sold by Grat the Traitor in the Goblin Camp. A nice passive increase to our damage by two points on gloves that are both immediately available and extremely cheap. The Boots of Stormy Clamor sold by Omelum in the Mycanid Colony. To this day, I'm not even sure what counts as inflicting condition, as it feels like I inflict a condition on enemies every time I just successfully land an attack on them. So these boots end up being a, a really easy way to just quickly apply a bunch of debuffs and stacks of reverberation on your enemies from what is otherwise a pretty underwhelming armor slot. For our weapons, I have the Club of Hill Giant Strength, from the top of the arcane tower. A lot of people miss this item or they never even knew it existed. It can be found in the wooden shack looking area at the top left of the arcane tower. Behind one of the animated armors, there's a stool that your character will make a remark upon sitting on it. And when broken, we'll drop the club of hill giant strength. The club sets your strength to 19, which is important as we'll be coupling it with the titan string bow which you can buy from the Zentrum in the Zentrum hideout after successfully delivering Rugon's package. The Titan String Bow deals extra damage equal to your strength modifier, which with our strength being set to 19 from the club, will be plus four. This additional four damage is especially strong as it's a damage rider that the arrow of many targets doesn't have, so it doesn't cut in half. The full four damage is applied to each target hit by the arrow of many targets. This bow, paired with high strength, will be your best bow in Act 1, Act 2, arguably even Act 3, if you can raise your strength to, for example, 27 with the Cloud Giant Strength Elixirs. For a second melee slot, I'm using the Adamantine Shield, you can get from just crafting it inside the Grimforge to make up for the lack of armor class of the Cat's Grace armor piece. Feel free to use just any shield you can get your hands on. The effect of the shield is a lot less important than the addition to our armor class. The best necklace for damage output is the Broodmother's Revenge dropped by Kaga inside the Druid's Grove. When you heal, it'll coat your weapon in poison, making it deal an additional 1d6 poison damage. You can easily activate its requirement by popping a healing pot right before entering combat, or even popping a healing pot in the middle of combat. So for such an easy requirement, it has a really good damage output. For our rings, we have the tried and true combo of the strange conduit ring from a chest inside the Inquisitor's room, inside the Kreshilek, and the caustic band sold by Dareth Bonecloak in the Mycana colony. Again, it's important to mention that the Broodmother's Poison Damage, the Conduit Ring's Psychic Damage, and the Caustic Band's Acid Damage do not get cut in half by the Arrow of Many Targets. That's precisely why the Arrow of Many Targets is as insane as it is. It allows us to apply the full extent of our Damage Riders to all targets that it hits, rather than just the initial target. For our alternatives, we start with the Shadow of Menzo Baranzin that you get from inside the loot room after having completed the first quest given by Sovereign Spa from the Mykonic Colony. It's not so much a replacement of your helmet as it is a nice utility piece that you can use to get a free invisibility once per short rest. Invisibility, as I've alluded to previously, will be the most consistent way to proc surprised, but as we don't have Assassin in the first act, it's also just a nice way of getting advantage to offset our sharpshooter penalty. Next is the Amulet of Branding dropped by the Gith Trader inside Kreshilek. Again, this necklace is not so much a replacement as it is a nice utility piece as you can only use its effect once per long rest. The effect Brand the Weak is extremely strong and can make an enemy vulnerable to piercing damage for one attack at the cost of a bonus action. 
Ideally, you should brand higher health enemies or bosses and then use an arrow of slaying on their piercing vulnerability to 4x the damage that you would otherwise do with your regular arrow. That setup and combination of branding the weak and arrows of slaying is how I want to two shot many of the early game bosses despite their health pools or resistances. If you find that your armor class is just too low to justify wearing the cat's grace, you can wear any other piece of armor that gives you a higher armor class. I have the adamantine splint armor that you can craft from Grimforge as it's probably the best defensive option in Act 1, but you can really use anything that has a higher armor class as we already have the critical hit negation from our helmet. For our weapon alternatives, we have the Knife of the Undermountain King sold by the same Gith trader inside the crash. Its effect grants us a point reduction to our critical hit range, or in other words, a 5% increased chance to naturally crit. As we can't multi-class into Assassin in Act 1 and therefore don't have our guaranteed crit turns, it's a nice way to increase our natural critical hits. Although a disclaimer that the knife should never replace the Club of Hill Giant strength unless you can raise your strength by other means like elixirs. If it's gonna replace anything, it should replace your shield, but that sets your armor class to about 16 with this setup of gear, which is a risk that you should take at your own discretion. Although you can get the Titan String Bow very early, I know that you can technically mess up the delivery to the Zentrum to where they'll, they'll turn hostile on you. So for people who can no longer buy it from the Zentrum for whatever reason, rest assured that you can buy it from Moonrise Towers in Act 2 and you should just use hand crossbows until you get there. For rings, we have the Smuggler's Ring that you can loot from a skeleton near where you first find Karlak underneath the destroyed bridge. It's really nice for lockpicking and stealth. It comes at a disadvantage that is rather insignificant to us as we don't really care about charisma. Finally, we have the Whispering Promise Ring that you can buy from Volo at any point in Act 1. It pairs really well with the Broodmother's Revenge Necklace, making it so that you both get the Poison Coating and Bless every time you heal in or out of combat. Moving on to our Act 2 gear, where we have a lot more the same as Act 1, with just a few choice replacements, but a lot more viable variety in terms of our alternatives, as well as the introduction of gear pieces that you can use for their effects rather than keeping them equipped through long rest. Our helmet changes to the Dark Justicier helmet that you can get from completing Shar's Gauntlet for a point reduction to our critical hit range, which again is useful whenever we don't have surprise or fights last beyond the first turn. Our cape remains the same, as does our chest piece, unless you've hit level 9 and therefore given an extra 2 points to your dexterity with an ability improvement, and you've given this character the hack error to their dexterity. If you've met both of these conditions, your character will have 20 dexterity without the graceful cloth, in which case you can wear the Yuanti Scale Mail sold by Quartermaster Tali at Last Light Inn, the Reaper's Embrace dropped by Kethric Thorm, or the Dwarven Splint Mail, which you can buy from Lan Tar after succeeding an inside check when talking with Disciples Zarel at Moonrise Towers. If you haven't met both of the aforementioned conditions, I think that wearing the Graceful Cloth is still your best option, as you can still benefit from its Cat's Grace effect, which is equivalent to wearing a feat, which is much more valuable in my opinion than the armor class benefit you would get from wearing the other pieces of gear. Our gloves change to the Flawed Helldust Gloves, which Damon can craft for you at Last Light Inn. On average, it'll do the same extra damage as the Gloves of Archery, but also has the potential to do more so we switch over to them. Our boots of stormy clamor remain, as do all of our weapons in the Club of Hill Giant Strength and Titan String Bow combo still being your best range option for damage output, with the only real change being your shield to the Iron Bandit shield, which you can get from right next to Land Tarp and Moonrise Towers for a plus one to our armor class. Our necklace stays the same, but one of our rings will permanently switch to the Risky Ring, which you can buy from the Drow Merchant in Moonrise Towers, permanently granting us advantage on all of our attack rolls and effectively removing the sharpshooter penalty entirely. Although we'll essentially never take this ring off, you can still switch the caustic band for any of the other alternatives or any other ring that you have that is better or at the same level as the alternatives. Moving on to our alternatives, we have the Covert Cowl, which is dropped by one of the mean locks in the Cellar of Last Light Inn. It's virtually the same as the Dark Justicier helmet, maybe only just slightly worse. You can replace the flawed Helldust gloves with the Dark Justicier gauntlets that you'll get from just below your gear inside the Sharn Monastery. But be warned that a lot of the enemies in Act 2 seem to be resistant to necrotic damage Damage, especially noticeably more than the fire damage that the flawed Helldust gloves give, which is why they're an alternative.
alternative and not really a suggestion. Again, if you find that your armor class is too low, you could actually go about switching your boots to the evasive shoes sold by Mattis at Last Light Inn rather than switching out your chest piece entirely. You can also always switch out your shield for the Knife of the Undermountain King. I would even suggest doing it if you're wearing anything besides the Graceful Cloth as then your armor class will be high enough to justify being able to switch out the shield for the knife. For rings, although the Risky Ring is a must, you can switch out your other ring slot for the Strange Condo Ring you got in Act 1 or the Killer Sweetheart that's dropped by your copy at the self-same trial. We also have the pieces of gear that I mentioned using for their effects rather than keeping them equipped. First we have the Drake Throat Blade sold by Roa Moonglow at Moonrise Towers which you can use to apply an extra 1d4 of an elemental damage type to your Titan String Bow once per long rest that lasts the entirety of that long rest. Next we have the Gloves of the Automaton sold by Barkus Root at Last Light Inn, which you can use interchangeably with the gloves you have equipped, in, in this case being the Flawed Helldust Gloves, which will give you advantage on all of your attack rolls for 10 turns, and the effect persists through unequipped. And finally, we have the Surgeon's Subjugation Amulet, dropped by Malice Thorm inside the House of Healing, which once per long rest can paralyze a target for two turns upon scoring a critical hit, which will not only force them to skip two turns, but will guarantee critical hits for all attack rolls made against them in melee range. Act 3 marks the accumulation and height of everything this build has to offer. It's the most damage we can deal, the most consistently we can get surprise, the most actions we have in a turn, and of course, our truly best in slot gear. Before you comment that there are better alternatives, I want to concede that there are more combinations of gear pieces in Act 3 than I could possibly account for. So this may not be the single best combination of gear in Act 3, but it is what I believe to be the best based on my playtesting. Even having said that, you can see that there are a multitude of new alternatives in this section, which this time, these are truly completely varied. Any and all combinations of gear pieces in this section would work effectively. It's just a matter of what works best for you based on your gameplay, your habits, and your team composition. Let's get into it. For our helmet, we have Saravox Horn Helmet, dropped by Saravok Anchev. It grants us an unconditional point reduction to our critical hit range, as well as an incredibly useful Dauntless effect making us invulnerable to emotion-altering conditions. The undisputed King of Capes continues to be our best cape. It's only real competition being the Shade Slayer cloak that you can buy from Sticky Dondo in the Guild Hall. But even then, the, the cloak's effect is only useful for one action, and its value falls off pretty quickly in comparison to the Deathstalker mantle. Our armor is going to be the Armor of Agility sold by Gloomy Fentenson near Sorcerer Sundries in the lower city, setting our armor class to, to what's really an unnecessarily high 23, considering we are a ranged build and won't be taking the brunt of the incoming damage from our enemies. Lots of good options for our gloves, but I went with the Helldust gloves dropped by Harlip in the House of Hope for an additional 1d6 fire damage on all of our weapon attacks, as well as some nice bonuses to saving throws and spell save DC. Funnily enough, I still wear the Boots of Stormy Clamor in Act 3. I find that most other boots, even in Act 3, only provide defensive bonuses, which are relatively redundant with how many ways there are to stay alive in Act 3. So we keep these as the arrow of many targets can quickly spiral the amount of reverberation you're applying to your enemies. For our necklace, I suggest the Amulet of Greater Health, which you can steal from the House of Hope as the final frontier of our defenses, setting our health to 144 without aid. This amulet is one of the main reasons I'm so inconsiderate of defense or sustainability in the rest of our gear slots. For rings, I still recommend using the Risky Ring, but you can even switch that out because we have an advantage on all of our attack rolls in the first turn of combat, and now finally, the damage to finish fights in that first turn of combat. In terms of what to switch it out for, feel free to mix and match literally any combination of two rings I've recommended up until this point, as all of them hold their own even this late into the game. Okay, 
Onto our weapons. Let's start with our daggers. This is a controversial choice, maybe even slightly unorthodox, but I recommend dual wielding both of the Dolor Amaros daggers, one of which drops from Dolor the Red Dwarf, and the other of which can be bought from the Ballas Merchant inside the Murder Tribunal upon becoming an unholy assassin. The justification is really simple. The dagger reads that when you deal a critical hit with a weapon, it deals an additional 7 damage. Because we have 2, each critical hit will deal an additional 14 damage. Because of Assassin, we can guarantee critical hits, and because of the arrow of many targets, we can deal the full 14 damage to all enemies hit by the arrow of many targets. In a mock combat scenario, you enter combat, the enemies are surprised, you shoot an arrow of many targets, it crits on all 4 targets because of Assassin, and deals at least 56 damage in total across all 4 enemies just from these daggers. I, I rest my case. Even if you don't have surprise or can't guarantee critical hits, our critical critical hit range is still reduced and we attack with advantage which should still give you a decent chance to crit to where they're useful even outside the best case scenario. Our bow is the most contentious piece of gear in this act. It took me a lot of time to make a decision regarding my recommendation. Operating under the Dolor Amaros principle, I can recommend the Vicious Shortbow sold by the same Ballas Merchant for yet another 7 damage on critical hits. When only considering the first turn of combat where we're guaranteed critical hits, this is by far the most impactful choice for our bow slot. But again, things don't always go to plan and fights don't always end in one turn. So I don't think that this is the best choice in a vacuum. The contingency choice is the dead shot sold by Fitz Firecracker near Sorcerer Sundries in the lower city, reducing our critical hit range to give us more natural critical hits outside of our guaranteed critical hits. But now we have the issue that inside of our first turn of combat where crits are guaranteed, the dead shot's effect is completely worthless and if feels bad to be using a bow that doesn't synergize with what we want to ideally be doing. So having considered the merits and demerits of both, I believe the happy medium to be Gaunter Mael dropped by Steel Watch Titan inside the Steel Watch Foundry. For one, it gives us a celestial haste, which means that we do not become lethargic when haste runs out, which is phenomenal as it can be detrimental to accidentally break concentration on haste and become lethargic at the wrong time. And for two, it comes with an attack called Bolt of Celestial Light, which outside of being just a generally strong ability, will make all of our subsequent attack rolls have an additional 1d4 radiant damage on them, which of course will be fully applied by the arrow many targets. Because of its all-around versatility and consistency, I think it just edges out our other options. Speaking of other options, a few of the alternative gear pieces include the Horns of the Berserker sold by Entharl Dantalon at Dantalon's Dancing Axe at Worms Crossing, the Cloak of Displacement sold by the same vendor, the Armor of Persistence sold by Damon in the Lower City for a heavy armor alternative to the Armor of Agility, the Ballist Armor sold by the Ballist vendor, although I would strongly recommend putting this on a melee build instead, like the Bardadin, shout out, as to not have to be within 7 feet of your enemies yourself as it will incur an attack roll penalty on you, the Evasive Shoes for more armor class, the Legacy of the Masters sold by Damon, the Crater Flesh Gloves sold by the Ballast Vendor, the Knife of the Undermountain King, Rhapsody dropped by Kazador, or any and all of Orin's daggers, the Broodmother's Revenge. Finally, be on the lookout for what is actually technically your best gloves in the Martial Exertion Gloves, sold by Bumpnagel, the Deep Gnome, in the Deep Gnome Hideout in Rivington. These act as an additional action surge once per short rest, which any item in the game that grants us more actions to use in our first surprise round are invaluable and should be considered top priority.